new nonprofit for the Columbia Basin, established by local sport leaders and Via Sport BC to support the sports sector across the Columbia Basin. Supporting everything from grassroots right up to Olympic and Paralympic athletes and everything in between. So athletes, coaches, local sport orgs, uh, officials, building capacity at each segment along the way um, for, for everyone in the sector. A little bit of sports sector 101. Um, we've got the Ministry of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport. Arms like to them is Via Sport. Via Sport gives leadership to all of the provincial sport organizations. So there's over 70 of those. And then parallel to that is this regional alliance strategy. And the regional alliance strategy is where I fit. And so there are six other Pacific sports centers across the province and three additional centers who do what, what our organization does, supporting, um, supporting the local capacity of those organizations, uh, not focused on single sport, but focused on the needs of the community. Um, and multi-sport programs, we know that uh, we, do, we don't want kids doing just one sport, especially in their younger ages, uh, physical literacy programs, things like that that fall outside the mandate of the provincial sport system or the provincial sport organizations, but are high needs and high impact in our communities. And so that's uh, the role that Pacific Sport Columbia Basin plays. We formalized in October, uh, and just this upcoming week, we will be doing our public launch, um, kind of with website and uh, quotes from the Minister of Sport, and et cetera. So you can look forward to that in local media and, and other channels. Um, and our major funder is the provincial government. Um, and so the play there is community development through sport development. The mandate and, and priorities are really aligned with those provincial priorities of uh, that, that the, the government has identified. So increasing participation, uh, including participation of underrepresented groups in sport, uh, indigenous, minorities, women and girls, um, LGBTQI2S, and, and those who traditionally haven't been able to experience the benefits of, of sport um, because of cost or systemic and structural bar barriers. To address those things, uh, a major role that we will play is supporting all of the safe sport initiatives uh, rolling out throughout the province through the NS, the national sport organizations, the provincial sport organizations, and the government. Um, improving policy and governance on local sport organizations, coach education and training. Um, and then the other major priority is around athlete development and participant development. We want more kids playing sport for longer, uh, retaining uh, particularly women and girls in sport who drop out at, at twice the rate of athletes uh, on their high performance journey. And so making sure that uh, young and wet men and women from our region have the opportunity to achieve their potential in sport, wherever that is in the life lessons that they'll learn along the way. So that could be enhanced testing and monitoring, increased access to strength and conditioning facilities, performance education, and things like that. So we know that kids who are physically literate have movement skills across uh, a number of uh, surfaces and they can run, jump, throw, and strike objects. They'll participate in more sports as they grow up. If they participate in more sports, they will more likely find one that they fall in love with and they'll, they'll stay in through their adolescence. Kids who are playing more sport during adolescence lead to healthier adults. Those healthier adults have uh, Help longer lives and more active lives, and are less burden on the healthcare system. And it's this entire cyclical model where they'll then invest in sport participation and recreation as priorities uh, for their kids. And you know that's actually really well proven in the science. Teenagers who participate in sport have better mental health and wellness. They have improved social skills and decreased risky behaviors, largely because sport and recreation uh, is an asset. They've got adults who they can go to, trusted adults who can guide them uh, outside of their parents when things come up. You know, it's adolescence. These things do come up. Um, and then on the high performance side, um, 
we develop lots of partnerships and programs to support the athletes in our communities and across the province. So, you know, Trail, you, you as a city, produce all sorts of really wonderful athletes uh, who do go on to excellence at national team levels and, and represent uh, the country at Olympic Games um, or in professional sport. And the ask before you today is to join uh, over 150 other partners in this GymWorks program. So GymWorks is coordinated and led by the Canadian Sport Institute, which is a partner organization of ours. And uh, we, they, we approach in partnership municipalities, private gyms, uh, food operators, um, and different performance consultants to give discounts to athletes or free access. So a lot of the gyms uh, in within those 150 partners are, are, are free access to those targeted athletes. Um, other partnerships include discounted physiotherapy uh, and things of that nature that really help those local athletes and makes a difference to their daily training environment so they can go on to achieve their potential. Um, the GymWorks program is has been in place for probably 25 to 30 years. Um, and it, it really does make a difference. You know, it's it's not a huge number of athletes. So there's the big long list that I get is about 4,000 athletes, but there's 73 of those athletes in the Columbia Basin. There's nine that are here in kind of the lower Columbia region. Right now, there's actually no trail athletes designated as trail as their hometown, but there's actually lots of trail athletes who are in Victoria or Vancouver, part of big, bigger training centers, and they're registered at those local sites, the Canadian Sport Institute um, or other Pacific sports centers where their daily training environment is. And so this program, when those athletes come home, they would be leveraging it. They would be the ones who get to go to the, the rec center um, for free, as well as uh, the local athletes who live and train in the region uh, whether that's um, uh, Blackjack or uh, over in Castlegar, um, et cetera. And so uh, it's not a huge ask, but it's actually really high impact. And the you're joining a network of, of other centers who are supporting our athletes. You know, the trail athletes are, are accessing the, the pools and gyms in Vancouver, Victoria, Coquitlam, Surrey, across the whole province. They're totally for free as a, as a uh, registered athlete with this, uh, across the network. So it's, it's really, really important and, and really high impact for those athletes. I guess at this time, I'll just turn it over to you and we can have a conversation about any questions. Um, you know, I'm again, thrilled to be here, uh, thrilled to introduce this program. Obviously, uh, my mandate is across the whole sports sector. Uh, and I'll probably be before you many more times in the future uh, talking about other <laughs> but um, yeah, happy to, to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, does Council have any questions for a delegation? I just, um, so how would, once we have this um, agreement, how would local individuals that are in sports, so let's say we've got tons of hockey kids in, in the community, how would then they participate? How would they, would they would have to register? Or is it who determines whether they're qualified to be part of this program or not? Great question. And so I get a list from that is created by the provincial sport organizations. So the provincial sport organizations have, a, have criteria that they put forward uh, and is evaluated by the Canadian Sport Institute and via sport. And if the athletes meet that criteria, so there are largely, if they're a national team athlete or a provincial team athlete, then they're on the list. And maybe uh, sometimes their Canada Games long list um, is extended to that to that group. But you is really determined by the provincial sport organizations. Um, hockey, hockey BC uh, limits theirs really to the WHL level. Uh, and then they have a, a bit of a more robust list on the women's side. Um, but as an example, that's how they set their criteria. Just, you know, when you do something like this and you've got young athletes mm -hmm. that all think they're going to the NHL, we want to make sure that we um, they understand if this is what they're doing, we're partnering, you know, what that looks like for them. 
Yeah, so they, they you can't just sign up. You know, okay. you know, you have to have a you get an invitation from your provincial sport organization, and I am carbon copied on that. And then there's an intake and a registration uh, where the athlete uh, signs after agreements and you know agrees to anti doping and and all of these uh, high performance type of things. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, it's really interesting to learn about this program. How's it going so far with Elevate? I see you partnered up with them. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I don't think any athletes have leveraged Elevate here in trail. And then we've got a coach and maybe three athletes who are consistently uh, accessing Elevate up in, in Rossland. Okay. They're blackjack uh, cross-country ski athletes. Yeah. Any other questions for council? Just curious myself, actually, um, with the upcoming BC Winter Games to be hosted in trail, are there any scenarios that you could see with sort of? Yeah, absolutely. I anticipate being uh, involved in the planning committee. Um, and we are on a number of emails back and forth about that. Um, you know, I, I think it's just fantastic. It's going to bring in probably close to three or four million dollars in economic activity to the region. Mm -hmm. And the impact on local athletes will be fantastic. So I really see my role, uh, or I anticipate my role being largely a liaison to the sports sector. So being the interface between the organization, organizing committee and the local sport orgs who will largely be delivering yeah. uh, the competition venues and things like that. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay. You're more than welcome to stay, of course. Yeah, and Trish is up next. And we'll have, yeah. So next we'll move on to uh, department reports. So Parks and Recreation, uh, I'll call on uh, Director of Parks and Rec, Coach Davidson, for your report. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Some of you again today. <laughs> the, um, so as you can see, we have a wonderful partner in the world of on the sports side of the Parks and Recreation world. So maybe just add a little bit of color. So Recreation's largest partner in the delivery of sport and recreation is the sport network. And so things like having someone like James who resides in Rosslyn and is contributing to the elite side of sport, but also a myriad of other things to support sport in our region is a, a wonderful asset to have here. And he's absolutely right. We will certainly be leveraging his involvement in sport and his connection to the sport network as we develop the BC Winter Games. Um, plans and that's you know not the too distant future so maybe just a bit of history about this program so um in the staff report i just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that this program came before council back in 2016. so the pacific sport columbia basin group initially did get started about back uh what, we can't do the math about nine years ago eight or nine years ago and unfortunately it just didn't work out at that point in time so the investors at the time or the partners decided they were going to wait until they found the right person in the right time to kind of move this project forward and james kind of landed on everyone's doorstep so it's um this project was shelf ready and was actually approved by council back in 2016 but we didn't get the opportunity to implement it unfortunately so i just wanted to draw your attention to that that um we have talked about it before and it's been on our radar for some time. Maybe just a couple of other points of interest just to draw kind of to some key points, I think within the staff report, uh, maybe I'll jump to uh, 4.5 under the analysis. So uh, James talked about the criteria. So for those that are going, oh my goodness, does this mean every child in sport gets to come for free to the aquatic center? And Trish is gonna tell us that we don't make any more money at the pool. That is not going to be the case. This is a very targeted program specific to elite sport development and people are chosen to go into this program. Back in my day of competitive sport, you were deemed a carded athlete. And so when you are a carded athlete within the province or the country, then you hit this sort of different world of training and sport development. And I'm going that's going back a very long time, but that was the point. And so it, it's a different card now that you kind of qualify under this new program and really kind of looks to develop kids or athletes at different modes of development over the course of their time in sport. And James talked a little bit about the number of people in the basin because I we knew this question would probably come up. So there's 73 athletes in the Columbia Basin. Um, there's eight that are deemed to be sort of within the Rosslyn Trail area, four within Castlegar, and 12 within Nelson right now. So obviously the hope is that 
we have lots of kids that are podium aspiring kids and or that want to reach the Commonwealth Games or whatever their sport desires are. And this is one opportunity to help with all of the costs that go into those training programs to see some of those kids uh, have a bit of a, you know, helping hand going forward. So the ask in front of you today is to um, have council support and principal the development of a partnership with specific Pacific Sport Columbia Basin to establish, uh, to establish a uh, partnership with the Trail Aquatic and Leisure Center specifically, and that council further approve that we enter into a partnership agreement um, with Pacific Sport Columbia Basin to support the training and development of elite athletes through that facility specifically. Thank you. Any questions for Claire? So clarifying the finance side of it, it's basically we're just waiting fees for those specific assets. Yeah, so the mechanics on a real high level level would be uh, James's organization would issue some form of identification to Trisha Davison, who's an elite athlete. It's going to be podium ready in 25 years. And the, sorry, I'm just kidding. Anyways, there's a card. <laughs> there's a card, and that we would develop an administrative practice in the background that if that card is presented to our frontline staff, that they would simply just not charge fees, and that person would be welcome to come into the facility and train. James's World also helps provide those athletes with information about our facilities so that when they come, they understand the etiquette, they understand what's expected, they understand the hours of operation. And obviously that can change and evolve as you've seen within our facilities in the last few months. So that James helps to kind of give them ways to communicate with us so that we can help them when they're here. You do have an existing policy in place that, um, I can't remember what the policy name is, I think I wrote it in the report. Um, it is called the Discounted Admission to the Trail Aquatic and Leisure Center for Provincial Level Athletes. And it provides a 50% reduction in fees right now to people who meet that mandate. I think in all of the time that I've worked in trail, we've had maybe three people take advantage of that over time. And so obviously with this program in play, uh, which supersedes what that benefit would be, we would, we would suggest that you... Um, uh, rescind that policy going forward and simply default to the GymWorks program. Mm -hmm. also, Just a, a question out of interest for the the athletes that are uh, qualified for this program that are look, the trail Ross area. What is the what what's the score? Is it mostly skiing or is it? Um, actually, trails produces a number of field hockey athletes oh, okay. and track and field or athletics cross country okay. athletes as well as triathletes. So kind of like summer sport down here in trail and then winter sport right. up in Rossland. And um, we do have a number of uh, Nordic skiers who are Olympic level um, up, up in Rossland. Uh, none of the Alpine skiers in Rossland are carded right now, um, but it's a, it's a whole smattering. There's okay. boxers oh, cool. in Castlegar. They're really emerging as a hub for boxing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it changed, and I get the uh, list updated every every few weeks um, with slight changes depending on the different provincial sport organizations and when they submit their lists. Right. But um, yeah, you know we really have diverse sport offerings here and and excellence across both winter and summer and up and down um, the different sports. It's really cool. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Okay. So the recommendation before you. Is a city council support and principle the development of a partnership with Pacific Sports Columbia Basin to establish the Trail Aquatic and Leisure Center as a partner in the Gym Works program, and the council approves staff to enter into a partnership agreement with Pacific Sports Columbia Basin to support the training and development of elite athletes at the Trail Aquatic and Leisure Center. Um, Councillor um, Hansen and Councillor Martin. All those in favor? Thank you. 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 Thank and they fall on corporate administrator and private people report. Thank you, Chair Butler. 
Um, so included in today's agenda package is correspondence from Ferrer Foods, where they are requesting the exclusive use of metered parking spaces adjacent to their property. And they're looking for the metered parking spaces all along Farwell Street. Presently, they have two dedicated spaces that is utilized for Starbucks, um, but there are an additional six parking stalls coming to the north end of the access to their property and five to the south. Uh, that would be more adjacent to Johnny, the Johnny Mufflers building. Um, so in their correspondence, they are suggesting that because they have been chosen um, to be the first Starbucks in Canada to provide a mobile order and pay option for clients, they are needing some 15 minute parking stalls and looking to have um, the meters removed. Uh, and just to clarify, I did speak with Mr. Ferraro and he has um, noted that they're the first independently owned grocery store franchisee to be um, testing out this mobile ordering. I think if you've been in larger centers at some of the corporate um, branches, you would be able to do the, the mobile ordering, but they are they're pretty proud to be um, testing this out for the smaller independent franchisees. Um, in background for council's information, uh, meter parking stalls are generally there for the use of all of the businesses, the clients, customers to the downtown. Over time, though, we have dealt with requests from um, particular property and, and business owners looking for the exclusive use of parking stalls. In, back in 2012, council had passed uh, a directive asking that staff um, put together some parameters around the exclusive use of parking spaces. And at that time, it was thought that limiting that privilege to very large uh, properties in the downtown. So all of those um, properties with a one-story building area exceeding 600 square meters would be eligible to make application. We further fine-tuned and um, finalized uh, through a council policy some guidelines for, for businesses' exclusive use of metered parking spaces in 2018, and a copy of that policy was included in the uh, communication package. Uh, there are limits contained in the policy as to how many uh, parking stalls would be provided, and so when uh, business, and in this case for our food, just looking for something outside of what is permitted under policy, it comes to council uh, mm -hmm. for your consideration. Had they been looking for just four parking stalls, which would be the limit um, for mm -hmm. the angle of parking, it would have been dealt with administratively. Um, however, uh, as they're suggesting, they may wish to have uh, up to 13 additional stalls. So there's, um, again, five on the southerly side and up to eight um, new stalls on, on, or sorry, eight in total on the northerly side. Considering though that um, there are, of course, other businesses in the area that would be impacted. Their clients and customers wouldn't necessarily be able to have convenient nearby um, access to parking stalls. It is staff's recommendation that if council is agreeable with allowing additional stalls for fur foods use, that it be limited to eight in total. Um, so that you would, uh, they would still have the two they have there and then up to an additional six if they choose. It is important to recognize though that uh, council cannot provide a benefit to business. And so under policy, we do uh, charge a fee for these uh, taking these metered stalls out of commission. And so presently the annual fee is $480 plus GST per metered stall. So depending on how many stalls um, council authorizes and how many furrow foods would choose um, to take out of commission, uh, we would then add to their annual billing for that. And so with that, um, if council has any questions, I'm happy to address them. Mm -hmm. The recommendation is that council authorize the exclusive use of up to eight meter parking stalls adjacent to the property at 850 Farwell Street for use by the customers of Furrow Foods and Starbucks. 
questions, Councilor Ross? Do you have a question, Michelle? Is there a way to put time limits on these parking spots? You know, like an, an eight to four, uh, something like that, or is it just twenty four hours? That's a trail foods. Well, once stuff? we once we take the metered stalls out of commission. Um, Signage is responsibility of Trail Foods to install, and then any monitoring of those spaces is theirs. Um, I think many people in the downtown core know the limits of the city's enforcement, and that um, our staff are uh, on hand until four thirty. Oh, okay. um, so there could be um, <laughs> there could be some use in after hours, but um, recognize that Trail Foods is open later into the evening gotcha. so they would want those um, those parking stalls sure. available through their operating hours okay. well, sir, um so just a question would in i didn't see anywhere in the documentation is there a certain number required for their mobile ordering approval like do they have to have so many stalls to obtain this mobile ordering sign off uh, Mr. Perot, Danny didn't indicate okay. that to me. Okay. They do have the whole of their parking lot available as well. Um, what they didn't want to do is decommission their uh, handicap access parking stalls that are right outside their door. Mm -hmm. So that is why they are considering instead the use of the meter parking. Councilor uh, Martin. Thank you. Uh, Four hundred eighty dollars. Does that that looks after an average of what a parking stall or a parking meter might be? Yeah, at, yeah, yeah. at twenty five cents yeah. times the number of hours. Yeah. I, that's that good. Yeah. Okay. I'm just wondering where I got that number. Yeah. yeah. About forty dollars a month. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it's a great question. I didn't know you wish myself. Yeah, yeah. I looked at it because I thought it's safe. Thing. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just another question. Um. Seeing that there are other businesses um, I, I, um, that have designated use parking, such as the Crown Point Hotel, how many spots do they have allocated based on their parking or their square footage? They have six stalls. Okay. Um, they have a bit of a unique situation whereby they have the Crown Columbia Hotel and then owned commonly, so same ownership, but under separate title is. Um, the building where the beer and wine store used to be, okay. and I believe that has now been consolidated into the footprint of the hotel, but it is still two separate titles. So they have six in total um, that they are billed annually for on Bay Abbey. Okay. Any other questions, Councilor? Yes, Councilor Vincent. I just want to thank you for including the, the policy. Um, it, it was pretty cut and dry. Um, I appreciate that very much. Um, just a question on it. Mm -hmm. When it's this, so 600 square feet and one story, what, what why one story? 600 square meters. Square meters. Okay. Um, well, that was just. Sorry, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not saying you're long. So it was, uh, it, as we worked through basically took a map of the downtown and looked at all of the larger properties okay. and determined what that um, square footage okay. would be. And so it really is just the the larger yeah okay the larger footprint um, where you would expect uh, there would either be a higher number of residential units if it were an apartment building or a greater number of customers coming and going and whether if it was a retail operation. Okay. okay. Great. Any other questions? No. Okay, the recommendation for you is that council authorize the exclusive use of up to eight meter parking stalls adjacent to the property at 850 Farrell Street to, for use by the customers of Ferrara Foods and Starbucks. So, Councilor Benson okay. and Councilor Hansen. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed? Okay. Noted. Motion passed. Thank you.